I guess. Okay, all right. So, good morning. Uh, we are glad that uh, there are some people here this morning after the cheese and wine party. <laughs> uh, anyway, so this is Nicola. I'm Ralf. And we are going to talk about, uh, in stereo, in fact, about, uh, about shell scripts. Uh, shell scripts in general and uh, Debian maintainer scripts in particular. So, uh, let me first start by reminding you what this is, maintainer scripts in Debian. Most of you will probably know this very well. So this is a citation from our great uh, policy and we will have quite, uh, quite some citations from the policy. Uh, so a DEP package contains two sets of files in general. The first is a set of files to be installed on the system when the package is installed, which we call the static, static contents of the package. And then you have a set of files that provide additional metadata about the package or which are executed when the package is installed or removed. Among those files are the package maintainer scripts. So these are the scripts we are interested in and we are talking about today. And these uh, maintainer scripts, you might have up to four of them in any single binary package. These are the pre-inst, post-inst, pre-rm, and post-rm. And their function is very roughly, well, when you install a package, then first you execute the pre-inst script, if it is present in the package. Then you unpack the static contents, the, the tarball, and then you execute the post-inst script. And when you remove a package, it's the reverse with the rm scripts. So first you execute the pre-rm script, then all the static contents of the package is removed from your file system, and finally you execute the post-rm script. And the situation is a little bit more complicated when you upgrade the package or when you downgrade the package, because then there is a mixture of these scripts of the old and the new version of the package, which are executed with additional arguments passed to these scripts in order to indicate to them what precisely is happening. Okay, so these are the things we would like to analyze formally to know whether they are correct. Uh, before uh, looking more into what this means, uh, a breakdown of what we have currently uh, about maintainer scripts. So these are numbers from which are more or less recent from May. Uh, we had at that time about 50,000 binary packages in, in SIT and uh, counting all the maintainer scripts, we arrived at about 30,000, which means that not every package has them. Uh, about these 30,000, well, you probably know that many of uh, or large parts of these maintainer scripts are today automatically generated by Dep Helper, Dep Helper stuff. But anyway, uh, we find among these 30,000 about one third, which contains at least a part of the script which has been written by hand. So which has not been introduced, inserted, by some of the DevHelper stuff. And by the way, we did some similar stuff, more basic an analysis some 10 years ago in, uh, in the Mancusi project. And there we obtained similar figures about, the, uh, about uh, the number, about the portion of maintainer scripts which are partially written by hand. So apparently this doesn't move too much over, over time. So about 10 script, 10,000 scripts are at least partially written by hand, which means they potentially contain bugs and contain errors. And this is something we should worry about because these maintainer scripts are executed as root when you install a package on any machine. So we should be defensive in writing these scripts and we should be sure that they are correct. Uh, a breakdown by language. So almost all of them are POSIX shell uh, with a few exceptions. So there are about 230 bash scripts, bin bash, uh, bin bash. 16 Perl scripts. Uh, there are five ASCII files. These are the findings according to the, find, to the file utility. And ASCII files means these are shell scripts which do not have the shebang. Uh, and uh, we will come back uh, to, to, to this case a little bit later. And there are even two ELF executables. And these are, in fact, for the packages of bash and of dash. And this is quite normal because obviously you cannot write their pre-inst uh, scripts as a shell script because you don't have an, an interpreter when you install the, the stuff. Okay. Um, so what policy says about uh, maintainer scripts is, well, they are not required to be shell scripts as we already have seen on a previous slide. Uh, C shell and TC shell are discouraged for various reasons. 
So there are uh, several papers and uh, documents available on the web which explain to you why, why it is bad to program in any of these languages. The policy says that they should start on a shebang and indicate the type of the uh, language which is used in the script. Uh, they should use set minus e. Set minus e puts the shell into a mode which we call in Debian the strict mode, but this is not a POSIX uh, term, term, uh, terminology. The strict mode means that when there is a command which fails, then the, com then, then the shell script itself will fail and it will not, exec uh, it will not continue execution of the script. Uh, this is what you usually would expect for a maintainer script because if something unexpected happens, you want to fail it noisily so you see that something went wrong. However, the set minus E, the strict mode, uh, one has to know that it is temporarily disabled in certain situations and uh, during execution of a shell script and we will also come back to this. Uh, so the POSIX standard for a long time, in fact, when we started our project, the POSIX, the version of the POSIX standard, which was mandated by policy, was an old version. Uh, and quite recently, this was updated. So we now, policy now talks about the version of the POSIX standards of 2017, which is great. Thanks a lot for that. Unfortunately, POSIX recently updated to a 2018 version. So we probably will have to uh, try to update this again. Uh, the policy also says that any shell interpreter should be uh, uh, should uh, implement the POSIX standard with some POSIX standard with some additions with some uh, Debian specific embellishments, and this concern the echo built in. If it is implemented, it should support the minus n option. The test when it is in built in, it should support the minus a and minus o option. We will also come back to this. It should support local scopes and the local uh, keyword, and we will also talk about this, and also some stuff we don't care about in the context of our project, because in our project we will ignore concurrent stuff and uh, signal stuff. Okay, so we will look at POSIX, uh, POSIX shells with these Debian specific extensions. Now, what we are trying to do in this project uh, globally is to get a formal uh, assertion of the correctness of these maintainer scripts. That is an assertion that they are behaving correctly on a semantic level. In fact, uh, to those of you who have been in Cape Town two years ago at DEPCONF, I gave a talk at that occasion where I presented the project and I gave an example of one of my own maintainer scripts which was wrong and which did terrible stuff because it removed too many files when you removed the package. Okay, so these are the kind of bugs we would like to find at the end of our project. I tell you right away, we are not there yet. Uh, so we took a long of uh, lot of time uh, by working on the front end of our toolchain, and this is in fact what we are going to talk about today. So this is about formal analysis. Formal analysis in the sense of program verification, of formal program verification, this is not testing. So we would like to get by formal analysis really an assertion of the fact that our scripts behave correctly in any possible legal situation. So it's much, uh, much stronger assertion than only, uh, only testing. So possible outcomes, well, we would, could probably get an assertion of correctness, but uh, there one should also be aware that all one can hope for is to obtain an assertion of correctness in some abstraction of a model, of the, of, of, of the model of the system, since anyway, what you have on a real uh, Unix system is a quite complex, uh, a quite complex thing, and you cannot, probably you won't be able to model all of these completely in something which can be handled by, by program verification. Another possible outcome, and this is probably something which, be, which will be much more useful for, for Debian, is bugs and finding possible bugs in uh, packages. And we have already found quite of them for the moment on a quite trivial syntactic level. Okay. And this is what we talk about today. And the first step uh, to obtain a tool chain which does all of this is to start with parsing of uh, shell scripts to obtain a syntax tree for shell scripts. And this yeah, is what we did first. Thank you. So that was already the topic of a talk that Ralph and Jan, another colleague, had uh, in MidiDebConf Hamburg about why uh, parsing POSIX shell is hard and how we did it in our project. 
The problem with POSIX shell is that it's not designed to be to, to allow parsing of whole files. It's designed to you, you should pass first one complete command, then execute it, and then you can go back to parsing. Which means that when you want to pass a whole script, you can get into trouble. Um, also, so also in order to have uh, nice features like being able to write make dir for or things like that. You have a parser that must be speculative and maybe promote key wo uh, words to keywords and try things and if that doesn't work, try something else, which is also hard to, to write. Um, yes. And one uh, specificity of, po of POSIX shell is also these here documents uh, and the difficulty about passing here documents is that they are not local things. So first you pass your, a comment, and when passing that comment, you discover that there will be a certain number of here documents that you will have to pass afterwards. And so you, you have to keep information about what you will need to do uh, uh, yeah, after passing your comment. And in fact, in general, uh, passing uh, statically one uh, full script is undecidable because you can have aliases maybe in branching conditions which makes it hard even on a syntactic level to know that uh, to pass the full file. So we have a parser that's called Morbic. Uh, it's available in GitHub if you want. Uh, it's written in the language OCaml and it uses one parser generator mania. So this is something we are proud of, the fact that we use the parser generator. The usual parsers for dash and bash are in fact pieces of C code, uh, handwritten, working on a character level basis. And in our case, we were able to use a really like the grammar that was in the specification of POSIX. Um, the Mania Parser Generator is a great tool that allowed us to not only write the grammar, but write the exceptions in the grammar that are required in order to have this speculative parsing that Shell requires. It allows that by giving you the, a way to introspect the, 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 the status of the parser and to, to maybe update it yourself if you want. That is, you can look at the parser, say, oh, it's starting to parse, I don't know, a new comment, so this is a place where if you read for, this might be a keyword. When you are somewhere else, you say, I, I already have started passing my command. I read for, I will keep it as a simple word and work that way. So this is something that is provided by these many parser, gener parser generator. Um, this allows us to have mainly really high level code that you can easily relate to the standard. So you, you take the, the, the grammar that is written in the standard, you take the grammar that is written in our tool and you can see that they do the same thing. And if you want to know more about all the things that happen in the inside this tool, there is already a, so probably the mini depth conf talk in Hamburg that has been recorded. What Mordic, Mordic produces is what we call a concrete syntax tree. This is a huge tree with, uh, in our case, like more than 50 uh, recursive type definitions. And in fact, what this tree represents is all the grammar rules that have been used to pass the script. So I don't know if that's readable on the slides, but you have like one type, type pair uh, grammar rule, so a complete command, a C list, uh, and or, and then one, one constructor of type pair, sorry about that, pair uh, rule of the grammar that you applied in that case. So this corresponds directly to the grammar of the POSIX standard once again, and the, so you can work on really what has been used. Uh, in our case, we will want to, to crawl through these trees, uh, to traverse them, to look at certain places like what happens in redirections, in function definitions, and so on. Since it's a huge tree, we would have to code functions for all the cases of the tree, say, saying mostly just keep going down in the tree and traverse the tree. So that, that would be really painful. Hopefully, we use something called the visitor design pattern. 
So there are what we call visitors, and you have certain kinds of visitors that are generated automatically, so we don't do that, in the, in the Morbic parser. And what they are, are they, they, they are objects that just do nothing but traverse the whole tree. Which means that you can later just inherit from these objects and override just the part that is of interest, and it makes it really easy to write something that go look into only simple comments, not touching the rest. We'll have an example in a moment. So once we, we have this parser and these nice tools, we've written a, a tool just that uh, runs statistical analysis of shell scripts because we wanted to know what, what was in this shell scripts uh, because that would guide our intuitions and what we would uh, doing the project. So this is another tool that is also available in GitHub. We've, we call it SHStats. Uh, we didn't have a fancy name for, the, for it, but it's nice. It works directly on the syntax tree that uh, Morbig outputs. It has a pre-processing pre uh, phase for the, shell, uh, for the scripts where it tries to expand the parameters that you can know locally, that is, if you have a constant that is defined at the beginning of your document, you are able to replace it everywhere in the document. Uh, Alf will talk about that later. And because of the visitor design pattern, it's easy to add an analyzer module. Uh, and here is an example. So it's quite a lot of stuff, but let's break it down to pieces um, quite fast. <laughs> uh, so analyzer, you just have to give it a name and it you give it a name and the, op the command line options that it requires. Uh, that's just for SH states to know who, uh, who this analyzer is. And then you write a process script function that will just be the way SH states provide the scripts to the analyzer. And in that case, it's a simple analyzer that, that just tries to see if, there are, uh, if you can find dollar, the, the character dollar, in the words. And what you do is you, you, you create an object, so it starts here, you create an object, you inherit from one of these vid visitors, and you just have to override one method, and this is what is here, you just override the method that visits the words. So all the other functions will still be the same and will just crawl the, the CST. And this specific function will just test whether you have a dollar in the word, right? Which makes it like in 10 lines, you've written something that goes down the whole tree and read at a certain place in the grammar if there are dollars. Um, all right. And then what you do is you just ask uh, this object to crawl the whole tree, and if it returns that, yes, indeed, I found a dollar, you add the file name uh, into a list of files that contains dollars. I think. Right. Okay. And, and then you have just to be able to output a report about what the analyzer did. In that case, you just write, uh, here is the number of scripts containing a dollar, and then the list of scripts if you want to see why they are here and what kind of dollar they have. Right. In that case, uh, just counting dollars could have been done in, with grep, and actually that's what I was doing like two years ago, a lot of grep things. Except that then you, you, you see that you have detected dollars that were in comments, so you have to remove comments, you can still do that with said maybe, and then inside quotes, and then there are here documents that are not expanded, so you, should count, you shouldn't count the dollars in there. And then, so each time you, you, you see that. Mm -hmm. I, I can't hear you, sorry. If, Please go to the mic. Okay. So, so, so I think oh. what, uh, what, uh, what Dan was saying, if, if you do a grab, you get only one occurrence per line, which is counted. Uh, but I think there are options to grab which allow you to, uh, to count all, all the occurrences on, on, on the line. Well, so. the point is grab is limited uh, because, well, limited. It does what it is supposed to do, but we need more than that here. And 
uh, in this case, so first, having really this parser and this tree traversal allows us to have this expansion phase that help us uh, like expanding uh, variables. We'll talk about that, I, I think, in the next slide. And then you can do much more complicated things, like if you count the dollars, but you don't want to count a dollar that is a variable bind, bound by a for loop, for instance, we can do that easily in our tool and grab through completely. Well, it's not made for that. And I'll leave Ralph okay. to talk about this expansion. So uh, I um, would like to talk a little bit about this expansion, which might seem trivial at, at first sight. So what it, what it does is, uh, I recall you that we try to, uh, to analyze the script statically, that, that is without executing it. However, there are some, when we do that, uh, we are often, when you write a shell script, you do uh, definitions, bindings of variables which are in reality constants. So you bind them once and then you use the same value for the same variable all the time. And we would like to exploit this in our analysis. So stuff like this, so you define a variable x and then in the branch you define a variable y. So you would find in line four, in fact, statically, even that x must be one and y must be two. And uh, on line seven, you would find that x still must be one, and now y must be three, because now you executed the else branch and not the send branch. However, if you st uh, drop out of the conditional, then you know still that x uh, has value one, because you haven't changed it anyway during the conditional. However, you don't know now what, y, what the value of y is. It could be one of two or three, uh, but we are doing not this kind of set-based analysis. Now we just would exploit the fact that we know that x has value one and y, we know nothing about y. Okay, so this looks quite easy. However, um, it is shell, and shell is weird. And uh, well, let's start to explain why I think that, why we think that shell is weird. Let's do a little quiz. So uh, imagine you have a shell script. And in the shell script, you have these three lines written, uh, written uh, on top of the slide. So x is one. Then you have something like x equals two and a call to something foo, whatever. And then you do echo dollar x. So what should, in your opinion, be the value which is printed by this? So possible choices. I give you five choices. The choices are one, two, 73, syntax error, or it depends. Okay, any other opinions? Well, I could, but I know. Five, okay, five. So two people are saying it depends. Very good. It depends on what? On the shell. It's access scoped locally to the line that is executed. I'm following it. Yeah. Okay, at x equals two, that variable setting is scoped to the line. So uh, at first, when you're just learning shell, and learning it well, you would say, oh, well, because that variable assignment goes out of scope after the command is executed, x must equal one. However, it's not that, um, you can't be so sure because foo might be something that sets x and then re-exports it to the environment. That's true too. Okay, so it depends. Uh, okay, thank you. So uh, um, it depends, in fact, uh, on, on several things. The first thing it depends on is whether foo is a, a function or a special built-in of the shell on the one hand, or whether foo is an external command, a command uh, which will be spawned as an external process. So if foo is something like bin whatever, uh, which spawns a process, then in fact the assignment of x to two is local to this line. So in this case, you would see uh, the value of one. However, if foo is a special built-in of the shell or is a function, then uh, the assignment of x to the value of two will be global to the context of the shell, and in this case, you will see the value of two. However, if foo is a function, foo itself can also set the variable x, as you correctly pointed out, and then you could indeed obtain the value of 73 in this case. Yeah? However, the oldest shells didn't have functions, so it must be one if you're using the oldest shells. Well, uh, we are talking about POSIX shells, and POSIX shells, have, uh, POSIX shells have, uh, must have functions. So this is uh, definitely something in all the shells which are permitted by, by policy, something which is, uh, which is possible. And, and special built-ins anyway. And special built-ins. Okay, so I think we have to, to hurry up a little bit. So uh, just to show you that this is a more complicated case, um, 
So this is kind of surprising. Uh, in case you don't know what it means, so here you have a prefix, then you have here something which, which will spawn a process, and then you uh, echo something, and in fact what happens here is, well, I can, can execute it, it's dash assignment process. What it does is, it prints A, so this is the first line, this prints A, uh, which is kind of surprising because in the prefix you said that X is B and Y is something, and uh, also C gets an assignment by, by, by parameter expansion here. However, this is not yet visible when you expand uh, the suffix of the command, which is kind of surprising. Okay, then we have seen the spawn process. So all the assignments which, which have been done by the prefix should not be visible after execution of the process. However, what we see with dash, and it will be the same with bash and in POSIX mode, is we see a and C, which means that Y, the assignment of Y, really is not visible here. However, the assignment of C, of, uh, of, of Z, is. So it's kind of weird. So the semantics is weird and the syntax is weird, and we are having a lot of fun of discovering various uh, features, features um, of the shell here. So it's not, it's not trivial at all. So not what, now what we found effectively on analyzing uh, the corpus of maintainer scripts. First, we found some really, really trivial things which would not have required a parser at all. So this was really, really easy. The first thing is missing shebangs in uh, maintainer scripts. Uh, in fact, policy says uh, they should be there in the maintainer scripts. And we found about 40 packages uh, which did not have them. And then we did, according to our regulation, to our um, uh, rules, what, uh, what has to be done. So we announced a mass bug filing. Uh, there was some discussion about the severity which would be appropriate for this. And we uh, settled on important. And almost all of them have, has, uh, have been fixed so far. So thanks for that. There are only five remaining of them. And these five are precisely the five ASCII scripts, ASCII files I talked about. Uh, when I talked, when I, when I did the breakdown according to, to language. Then set minus E. Uh, set minus E is necessary to make shell scripts fail in case one of the commands uh, in the shell script it's, itself fails and they should, it's written they should be there. This should be done by any maintainer script either by setting set minus E, this is the, the normal way to do it, or by taking care of the way how you launch, how, how you invoke external commands and make them fail. Uh, fail with an, with an exit one uh, in case there is, a, there is something not uh, expected. So we found again uh, some 50 packages which do not follow this policy. I looked at all of these cases to ensure that the maintainer did not something else to make it fail as it should. And uh, we did some mass bug filing again after discussion and uh, a qu about a quarter of them have been fixed so far. Then we have the case of local. Um, maybe we should skip over this because we are already a little bit short of time. Uh, local is also strange in shell. Everything is strange in shell. Uh, the reason why local is shell just very, very quickly is uh, local does not have an, an, an end, as in Java, where you have a bracket group and then you have a local variable local to that bracket group. Local in shell just says from now on that variable is local. Okay, and then you made stuff something like this, uh, which makes a variable x local dependent on something which happened before. And this means that the parser, if you imagine that you would like to write, uh, to write a compiler for shell, a parser cannot know whether a variable is local or not. And that's, that's strange. Okay, again. Uh, and we found indeed that there are some cases, we did it just yesterday, so this, uh, we, we didn't look in, uh, into this into, in detail, but there are 280 cases indeed where there is a local inside a control structure, of a while sometimes even. And we have to look uh, more uh, in detail into this to see whether this is a problem. Uh, then we have more stuff, I think we should skip also over this. Um, then we did an analysis of the commands, and I give back to Nicola of, of the commands, and we did this in fact because we just wanted to know which commands are mostly used in the scripts in order to know how we should build up our, our model. All right, okay. I was just checking, did you, yeah. you weren't seeing the results. So in your opinion, what would be the three most used, so maybe we won't do that, we don't have time, but you can just imagine what, what would be the three 
most used. Do you really see you that? Okay, you can read it. Okay. All right, <laughs> it's visible. So the first one is test, which occurs in like half of the scripts, but then more than like in in average four times the script. People seem to like tests. That's good. Then you have set, which is present in most scripts, which is something we almost already said. The third one is true, actually, uh, in number of occurrences, not files, because people love to, to do or true just to, to, to forget about a mistake. So there are not so many files using them, but when they do, they do use them a lot. And then you have others. So we have uh, interesting, maybe you have which that is not uh, so here you have which, which is present in like half of the files. So if we if we were to order them by files, it would be set, then test, then which there. And we see DPKG main script helper. That's good to see it there, uh, or depth systemd helper. And maybe we won't pass so much time on this slide. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have an analyzer that gives us which command are used and in which way. So for instance, if you look at in which way set is used, you see that in a huge amount of cases it's for the minus E flag, which once again is not really surprising. If we look at like potentially dangerous commands like remove, you have that most of the time it's uh, the force flag that is used and sometimes recursive and force, uh, which is like the frightening part. And if you look at, for instance, DPKG, you can see that mo so four out of five cases of DPKG are just there to list the files of the, of the package, probably to remove some of them. Uh, maybe I'll just keep mm. to it. And yes, when, when you look at that, so the first thing you have to do is you look at what is used the less, because it's sometimes where we weird things happen. All right. Uh, and for instance, this is how you, you can see that you, you discover makedir minus f, you say, wh what is it? You check that it doesn't exist, and we find a few bugs like that. In that case, it was makedir minus p. Uh, do you want to? Okay, yeah, okay. So then we looked a little bit more in detail on, on tests. Um, we did a little, we, we, we wrote a little parser for the test expression itself. And so we have, we have here some statistics about the different comparison operators and tunary file test operators, I, we won't talk about this. I would like to talk about something else, which is more interesting, in fact. Well, maybe here uh, you see these are the binary operators which are mostly used. Uh, luckily for us, these, uh, the last two ones are not POSIX, uh, they are supported by, by, by GNU, uh, GNU test, and in fact, uh, NT is newer than comparing the timestamps. And EF, this would be troublesome for us for doing uh, theoretical modelization of file systems, uh, file systems with, uh, because it means comparing whether two passes point to the same inode. And if this were uh, used a lot, it would mean that you would have to model file systems like, like, uh, like, like DAX, like graphs. And the fact that this is not used means we can just model them as trees and just ignore the cases where something like EF is used. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, minus A and minus O. Uh, why? Because uh, they are mentioned in the policy. So policy again says, uh, test if implemented as a built-in must support minus A and minus O. Minus A and minus O are for AND and for OR to combine complex tests. However, when you look at what POSIX says, POSIX says, well, it's obsolete. First of all, it's an extension only. It's not in the core of the POSIX standard. And furthermore, it's mentioned as being obsolete and it's recommended not to use it. Why? In fact, the GNU page says exactly the same thing and the reason why both uh, recommend to not, not to use it any longer is the same because it's ambiguous. And why is it ambiguous? Well, this comes from the fact that uh, test expressions contain also a special case which allows you to write a test without any operator. If, in fact, if you write in the test expression only one single word, it is already a valid test. In fact, it is a test whether that word is non-empty or not. So like writing a minus, minus n in front of it. In this case, you can uh, just drop the minus n, and that makes the whole thing completely ambiguous. For instance, uh, a valid test expression is something like this, parenthesis equals parenthesis. And there are two ways to read this. 
Um, and first of all, it, you might find strange that someone would write it, but maybe someone didn't write it directly, but he wrote parenthesis dollar one equals dollar two parenthesis, and then these two param param parameters are expanded to nothing, and then you obtain what you have written here. In fact, you can read it either as left parenthesis is the same as right parenthesis, this would be false, or you could read it as uh, the string equal is non empty. And this test is written between parentheses. And this would be true. Mm? So it's ambiguous in its structure. And in fact, this can also lead to an ambiguity in the result, which would be obtained. And then you can do funny stuff like this. This is, in fact, legal, a legal test, minus a, minus a, minus a, minus a, minus a. Uh, for me, there's only one possible reading. But apparently, uh, there are other opinions. Because, in fact, dash says that the result of this is 0. And bash, even in POSIX mode, says it's one. So it's weird again. And maybe this is a good reason uh, why we should not uh, really use this. Uh, and in fact, you can, uh, of course, replace it just by the AND and OR operators of the shell, which is a much safer way to, uh, to do this. OK. Uh, another interesting thing is, and this is again a design flaw of the, of the shell, is uh, that we found uh, almost 10 errors in the test expressions, in fact, syntactic errors in the test expressions in the maintainer scripts. And uh, now the, one has to understand why this hasn't been detected before. One would expect that if someone does a syntactic error in a test expression, then the first person who installs the package will find this error and complain and send a bug report. This hasn't happened. Why? In fact, the shell uh, confuses the Boolean conditions, true and false, with presence and absence of errors. OK, and this is the problem. If you have a syntactic error in a test expression, this will just make the test operator fail, and the shell sees it, sees it at false. You might get an, an error message uh, printed to standard error, but this is easily ignored if you install a, a, a lot of stuff. And the result is just that the test does not behave as you would expect it to do. OK, so I will show you some of these, uh, of these things. We have found stuff like this. This, of course, is false. Pathfind would be a function in this case. And here, of course, you would want to apply the function pathfind to the argument. So this should be something like this. This is something we found several times in, in, in scripts. Here, what is missing is just uh, an OR operator between the second and the third uh, sub-expression. Uh, why hasn't this been found before, one might ask? Well, the reason is uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, this test will succeed in case that $1 is removed. And in all other cases, including disappear and purge, it will just fail. So it does something, but it does not what the maintainer intended. This is another one, a classical one. Uh, of course, this is a, token, a problem with uh, cutting, with um, decomposing the input into tokens. Uh, what is missing here is a space before the bracket. Everybody has done this mistake. Uh, and then again, the test just fails. Hmm? It always says false. Or this one, so there's a missing continuation line. For the same reason, this all also fails uh, just miserably. And we found something like this. Uh, uh, the less symbol is not even a POSIX test. Um, the back, backslash is probably not necessary. And anyway, the person probably intended here to do a DPKG compare. Hmm? OK. So stuff like this, we found nine of them. And I think, and of course, we filed bugs against all of them. And then we have uh, redirections. Yes, that's, uh, and we should maybe hurry because. No, yeah. OK. <laughs> uh, OK, this is something we, we found recently by just saying, uh, are redirection used? Yes, probably, but what's in there? And actually, we, you, you can see a lot of these where you, so with these two redirected to one and then one redirected to devnel, do you know what it does? I, I, are you sure to know what it does? So what, what it does is, first, it takes whatever one was writing to, and say two should write to the same thing. Right? So if one was writing to standard output, two is now also writing to standard output. And then it tells you, and now one should write to dev null. But that means 
and this is probably not what is intended when, when writing something like that, if this foo command here uh, logs something on the standard error, this is now redirected to standard output instead of flushed away. And you probably mean the reverse, that is, first you redirect one to dev null and then two to the same thing as one. Right? And actually there are like uh, more than a hundred occurrences of that possible problem. And so we, we should discuss probably at some point if uh, we should do a mass bug filing. Uh, and also you discover like useless redirections, like one should redirect to the same thing as one, or one should redirect to the, no, yeah, wait. Yes, one should re redirect to the same thing as two, and then one should redirect to dev null. So we, we can detect a few. So these are like non-dangerous bugs, but still bugs nonetheless. Uh, maybe to conclude really fast in order to have a few questions maybe. So we are in the Coli project launched by uh, uh, Ralf here and we aim at like checking the correctness of uh, Linux scripts in general and in fact Debian packages in particular. Uh, this is a project founded by the Agence Nationale de Recherche which, which is just something found, found, founding research projects in France. Uh, we still have two years to have, have fun with shell scripts you can check the main page, and in the future we want to go further, and not only on a syntactic level, but uh, look at things with funny names like tree transducers, symbolic execution, to check more interesting properties of scripts. And I think we have like a short time for questions. Uh, thank you for your, for your attention. Hi there. Um, I haven't uh, done any packaging in a while, but um, we used to have dot config scripts, which were also shell scripts, and they interacted with debconf. Um, are mm -hmm. they still around? And if so, shouldn't you expand the scope of your searching to gather those as well? Huh. Uh, possibly. Well, uh, you have seen that uh, in our project, we are already late now, and uh, <laughs> it's quite complicated. So I think for the moment we prefer to focus on, on the maintainer scripts. There is just, they're okay. all, 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 they're all doing similar stuff and have the, the so config the, scripts are maintainer place. scripts, or at least they were so, 10 so years ago, 10, uh, 13 years ago. It's 2018 now. Yeah. They belong to the package. Yeah. They, they, it's just they go into var lib dpackage scripts. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm an old timer. I okay. used to maintain X386 back when okay. X386 are you, are was you, a thing. Are you Brandon? I'm sorry? Uh, what, 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 what's your name? So oh, you Brandon Robinson. Brandon Robinson. Okay, so I, I thought I... I yeah, I've got a lot of painful okay. experience okay. with shell scripts. So that's, okay, good to you. Good, I, good, I love good, what you're doing, by the way. This is, yeah, okay. this is yeah. excellent yeah. work. Okay. Um, no, so in fact, these config scripts are... So they are just present statically in the archive too. And we can probably just copy their contents into... like When you do the source, it's, it's basically just copying the contents and then handling them, that's probably not so much a problem to yeah, it's work just, on this config. Yeah, they're just named package name dot config, mm -hmm. and mostly they just do doc, reads and I, writes I, to I, the... I don't understand doc, doc and fig? So Yeah, they're, it's, it's a debconf thing. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, that was the last, like, maintainer script that was added, and it, okay. it okay. started happening about 2000. Yeah, okay, so, so we still have a lot of doc, doc base uh, files there, and of course we should, we should include them in the analysis, you're right, because there are setting variables which are used in the, in the, in the script, in, in the, the, the main script after yeah, that. Yeah. Don't call it a registry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One I saw your uh, set minus E, et cetera. Apparently nobody's ever using the earliest, the original idea of set, set the positional parameters. They're just setting the options. Nobody's setting a or one and two and three positional parameters. Okay. I do it all the time, but so yeah. we didn't see this uh, in the scripts. And um, well, I th like I don't, I, I we don't have the so. results. Like if if this is used, this is like in less than 0.4 percent of the cases of set. So mm -hmm. this is really not so much used, indeed. All right. Okay. I think we are out of time anyway. Yes, <laughs> he, he agrees. So thanks again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.